Okay, let's turn to number 511. We'll sing all five verses. All that thrills my soul is Jesus, 511. And let's stand to sing. Oh, you can stand up that long. <laughs> we got to make sure that Kurt has enough time to get up there and up there too. I always try to find a five verse in when I have to do it, so... Share the heart like Jesus, for his presence all divine, true and tender, pure and precious. Oh, how blessed to call him mine. Oh, praise my soul is Jesus, he is more than life to me. In my blessed Lord I see Love of Christ so freely given Grace of God beyond degree Mercy higher than the heaven Deeper than the deepest sea Oh, thrills my soul is Jesus he is more than life to me, and the fairest of ten thousand, in my blessed Lord I see. What a wonderful redemption, never can a mortal know. All my sin, the red like crimson, and be whiter than the snow. Oh, thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see. Every need his hand supplying. Every good in him I see, on his strength divine relying, he is all in all to me. Oh, yes, my soul is Jesus, in for that life to me, and the fairest of ten thousand. In my blessed Lord I see By the crystal flowing river With a ransom I will sing And forever and forever Praise and glorify the King Oh, thrills my soul is Jesus he is more than life to me, and the fairest of ten thousand, in my blessed Lord I see. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. I love that hymn, but I hope that you can sing it with meaning. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. Other things may make me pretty happy, but... <laughs> All that thrills my soul is Jesus. Please take your Bibles and turn over to the book of Revelation. Tonight we start the church at Smyrna. We'll do a quick review of the church at Ephesus, which is probably the one that we'll, we'll have spent the most amount of time on for several reasons. Number one, we know more about it than we know about the other churches. Uh, and so thus we see a lot of references there. Uh, but the second reason is, of course, it is probably the one that is most closely allied with or parallel to our own church. And so there was much that we needed to learn in terms of practical things so that we don't fall into the same problems that Ephesus fell into. But tonight we're looking at church number two, the church at Smyrna, the first part of it. Ephesus, seven verses long. Smyrna, only four verses, just about half the amount of words uh, for the church at Smyrna that were given to Ephesus. And I think you'll see why as we begin to get into this study. We're in Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. 
and unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Amen. Dear Father, we pray that as we study the church at Smyrna, you might prepare us for things that may be soon happening here in the United States. Where the test of true faith will come to us, perhaps, in the form of vicious persecution. Already we see we are losing certain rights, while those who are in the devil's camp are on the ascendancy and gaining so-called rights. And to speak against them is not merely political suicide, but someday it may mean that those who speak out against them will in fact be taken captive, tried, tortured, and put to death. We do thank you, Father, for the many decades centuries now that we have had freedom in this country but we see it quickly evaporating as it can easily do we pray father for your blessing on us as we study this church for we pray it in jesus name amen a couple of quick summaries summary of satan's methods at ephesus and we'll see that that was different than pergamos where satan's seat was because Satan didn't live at Ephesus, so he used different tactics at the church at Ephesus. That church had obviously taken the Apostle Paul very seriously, and they had tried very hard to keep their doctrine and practice pure. But we saw that Satan gained two footholds at Ephesus that later resulted in incredible doctrinal compromise. The first foothold he got was Ephesus lost their first love. Never forget that. That is the very first warning to all of the churches in the book of Revelation. It is perhaps the biggest warning because it means that God himself will destroy that church. The second foothold Satan got was there was an eventual leadership conflict that split the church as Paul warned in Acts chapter 20. Those are the two footholds. Make them lose their love, split their leadership. Satan has used those methods over and over and over and over through church history. Now let me give you a quick summary of the doctrine of Balaam. We studied the doctrine of Balaam to analyze his deeds to know what that doctrine was. We saw it was set in parallel to the Nicolaitans doctrine. We looked at the many passages dealing with Balaam to see what his apostasy included that ended in grotesque moral depravity. We saw the first error of Balaam was covetousness. The second error of Balaam was his willingness to twist access to God to please another human being. The third error of Balaam was mixing knowledge of the true God with witchcraft. The fourth error of Balaam was his pride, which was obviously seen in his desire to get honor from men more than honor from God. The fifth error of Balaam was testing God to see if God would change his opinion. The sixth error of Balaam was making God a limited territorial God. The seventh error of Balaam was his willingness to use what we would call his Bible knowledge concerning the holiness of God to accomplish what he could not do through a curse 
teaching Balak how to make God judge his own people. You know, that really happens with almost all of the churches, five of the seven churches in the book of Revelation, where God himself has to come down on them. Nobody has to destroy them from the outside, but because of corruption in the church. The eighth error of Balaam was approve, with the approval, the condoning, and promotion of sexual immorality to accomplish his own ends. We looked at many passages. We looked at Numbers 25 to see how Balaam managed to get his reward, and he used sex with pagan worship. And uh, we see that very clearly stated in the New Testament. We looked at those New Testament passages. We saw that he was personally responsible for what happened in Numbers 25, where 24,000 people died in the plague, and we read that this morning also. You recall over in the First Corinthians. And Phineas stabbed Zimri and Cosby through, and so God blessed Phineas as a result. We saw that Balaam got what he wanted. He got his money, but then he got kill, killed by the invading Jews. <clears throat> Killing, and the, one of the things that was really, at least to me, was striking when I was studying this and suddenly realized, killing Balaam and defeating Midian was the last mighty act of Moses before God took him to heaven. And we learned this morning and last week why God took him to heaven in the morning worship, because he failed to obey God precisely with what God told him to do. You can't change what God tells you to do. You can't twist it a little bit. You can't say, I think there's an easier way of doing this. You've got to use his process and his procedure, and you have to obey to the letter. God doesn't allow you to do it any other way. Moses lost it all, lost his life, and lost the privilege of going across the river into the land of promise because he varied what God told him to do. He said, God said, speak to the rock. He smote the rock the second time. You can't vary what God says even when you're frustrated. From this we learned that our accomplishments are not a way of keeping ourselves alive. And we gave a very uh, clear illustration, I think, of that when we look at Hezekiah and we saw that sometimes it's better to die rather than begging for life. Because King Hezekiah begged for more life based on his works and his faithful service to God. God granted his request, but it resulted in horrible destruction. We saw that that's not only recorded in 2 Kings chapter 20, it's recorded again in the prophecy of Isaiah, where we find more details given to us. And as I hope you've heard me say many, many times before, if God says something once, it's final. If he says it twice, he's shaking you and telling you, wake up. This is something you need to pay attention to. So it occurs twice in scripture, big, long, extended passages dealing with that issue. If Hezekiah had died, his son Manasseh would never have been born. Hezekiah ruled for 15 more years after the fig incident, and Manasseh was 12 years old when Hezekiah died, which means he was born three years after the fig incident. He was the very worst king that Judah ever had. He reigned for 50 years, longer than any other king of Judah. He's the king that had the prophet Isaiah killed, the one who had prophesied to his father, the one who had come in and told him, get your affairs in order because you're going to die. It was Manasseh who killed Isaiah. We saw something also very strange. God brought Manasseh to repentance and let him live after all his wickedness, but God killed Moses after all of his goodness. <laughs> your salvation is not based on your works. And your life if it's time to go, don't try to get God to change it because you may end up like Hezekiah in this situation. Moses spent his entire life serving God as the greatest Old Testament prophet leader. He disobeyed once and God took him home. Hezekiah spent his entire life doing evil. God had mercy on him and brought him to repentance, which of course is a great emphasis for us on the mercy of God. But it also tells us that godly leaders are more accountable than wicked leaders whom God may choose, if he wishes to do so, to save by grace. Hezekiah lived beyond his time and brought captivity to God's people. He brought pilfering of the Jewish treasures at Jerusalem. His extended life produced the worst situations that Judah had ever experienced. He got his heart's desire, but it produced chaos and ruin. It's an exact reflection of the wilderness wanderings we saw uh, that we've been studying in the morning. Hezekiah had a carnal request, God granted it, but it ended in destruction. And that's something that God very clearly states will happen. 
It talks about Israel in the wilderness, and it says, They soon forget his works, <coughs> Psalm 106, 13. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceeding in the wilderness. They tempted God in the desert. Verse 15, burn it in your mind. He gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. I would rather not have my request than have leanness sent into my soul. I would rather do without the things that I so dearly desire and have God give those things to me but leave me spiritually hollow and empty. I hope you feel that way because his spiritual blessing is worth so much more than all this empty stuff. There are a lot of warnings for leaders and congregations. We saw Balaam's death and his defeat of the Midianites recorded in Numbers 31. Uh, verse 8 says, They slew the kings of Midian, besides the rest of them that were slain, namely Evi, Rechem, Zur, Hur, Reba, five kings of Midian, Balaam, also the son of Beor, they slew with the sword. It doesn't matter what you get here. Someday you are going to die, and if you got it the wrong way, God may say, <coughs> Okay, I'll let you have it. Tomorrow you die. Like the rich man that Jesus told about, and he said, Man, I got all these goods. I'm going to lay them up in store. I got my barns full. I got money in the bank. I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. Jesus said, Thou fool, this night shall thy soul be required of thee. Focus. Where's your focus? There are so many lessons here. We're just moving through them quickly. We also looked at the New Testament where Balaam is set forth as an example of wickedness for four reasons. He abandoned godly separation. He deliberately defiled morally pure character. He clutched at worldly conformity, and he taught a perversion of so-called Christian liberty. His decadent moral teaching is what's called the matter of Peor, where he taught Balak how to send in the beautiful girls of Moab to commit fornication with the Israelites so that God himself would judge them. We closed with two passages out of the New Testament, out of Jude and Peter, both of whom mention Balaam as the epitome of apostasy and the conclusive moral failure of his type of doctrine. Jude one eleven, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, ran greedily after the era of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gay, uh, gainsaying of Corey. You say, well, okay, so what, what was the problem? Peter tells us, Second Peter 2.14, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. It's immorality, beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have exercised his covetous practices. Ah, greed, that was one of Balaam's things, cursed children which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Basor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumbass speaking with man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. And that gives us not only the background of Balaam, but it also gives us what the Nicolaitans were doing. And that, that caused, ultimately, the destruction at Pergamos and certainly was dangerous for the church at Ephesus, uh, at Ephesus, even though they're the ones who rejected very soundly the doctrine of uh, the Nicolaitans. But we saw what happened 400 years later. Uh, we talked about the different things that happened in the early church councils, the church at, uh, council at Ephesus. We talked about five reasons why uh, the church at Ephesus should never have fallen into that doctrine. Uh, they had Paul that started the church. Paul had ordained the elders. Paul had written the incredible book of Ephesians of the church. Church history records that Timothy was ordained the first bishop uh, close to the time of Paul's death, and Christ himself commended the church 30 years later for their firm doctrinal stance in the book of Revelation. But he warned about the loss of first love. We talked about how Pope Francis, on January 1st, 2018, called uh, for the so-called Feast of Mary, the Mother of God, 28 years ago, back in 1965, Pope Paul VI proclaimed Mary the mother of the church. But at the Council of Ephesus in 431, the council invented the exaltation of Mary and was the first church council to apply the term mother of God to Mary. And that was in Ephesus. We looked about all the ancient worship in Ephesus, how they were worshiping the queen of heaven, how they were uh, having a temple prostitute. I mean, that, that was a horrendous hundreds of prostitutes at the Temple of Diana in Ephesus. Uh, and we saw about the riot there in Acts chapter 19. Uh, we covered a lot, a lot of material in relation to Ephesus. The New Testament says a lot about the church 
at Ephesus. We saw that there was clear demonic activity at Ephesus. The demons had infiltrated the synagogue. We saw that the, uh, in fact, the exorcist Jews were seven sons of one Sceva, who was the chief of the priests. They're at Ephesus, and they were trying to cast out demons using incantations with the name of Paul uh, or name of Jesus. And, um, of course, the demon, the demon-possessed man jumped on him, beat him up, stripped off their clothes, and kicked him out the door. Uh, <clears throat> we saw that initially there was clear separation of the church at Ephesus to true doctrine and an abandonment of pagan practices. But then we got to the heart of the paganism surrounding the church at Ephesus, which was the fertility goddess worship of the worst sort. And that brought us to the end of the church at Ephesus. There was a lot about Ephesus. I hope you picked up some of that because it's the kind of thing you have to watch out for in this particular church. Now, we move over to the church of Smyrna tonight. And one of the things that is of greatest interest, I think any of you who've studied church history know this, but that the more the church goes through persecution, the more it gets pure and the stronger it gets. That seems crazy. You know, anybody else who gets persecuted gets wiped out and it doesn't come back. But with those who are Christians, when they come under persecution, it drives out the phonies. Genuine persecution drives out the phonies. And those who are true believers become more committed, more diligent, and more zealous for Christ. That's what happened at Ephesus. Excuse me, at Smyrna. You know, we pray that we don't have to go through persecution. Because when you're not going through persecution, you have more freedom to do things, and, you know, you can go on mission trips and do all kinds of really cool things like that. Uh, and it all seems like really hunky-dory, good Christian living and witnessing and all of those things. But what we see both in the New Testament as we look through the book of Acts and as we see here with the Church of Smyrna and as we look at church history is every time persecution arises on the church, it cleanses the church. Some of the really firm believers get killed. Smyrna was where Polycarp, how many of you ever heard of Polycarp was? Where he got martyred, a disciple of John. You think, why would God take the best ones out? Because God wants the ones that are not the best ones to get on the stick and start growing. God takes out, in many cases, principal leaders who have been faithful and have not flinched in the face of the sword. And when they're gone, suddenly, those who have been sort of lurking in the shadows in the background realize they said they believed it. Whoa, we know they believed it. Because when they were put on the stand, they didn't change their tune. Ephesus comes first. Great church, a lot said about it in the New Testament. But today it's dead. It never returned to its first love. Smyrna, we don't know very much about it. This is the only place in the New Testament that Smyrna is mentioned. Only four verses are given to us here. But it's one of only two churches that Christ doesn't rebuke. We ought to learn something about Smyrna because if persecution arises for the church today, you're going to want to be like Smyrna. What's happening today in the world? You think about the communist countries. You think about China, what's happening to believers. They're being sent off to concentration camps. North Korea sent off to concentration camps. In Russia, what has happened to the believers? What happened all during the, you know, the years since the Russian Revolution in 1917? Believers carted off to prisons. 
many of them died. Wherever communism goes, it cannot tolerate another god because the government is god under communism. You think about Muslim countries. How much freedom do Muslim believers or do Christian believers in Muslim countries have to openly worship? In this country, Muslims have plenty of freedom to worship and they also have plenty of freedom to spout their nonsense stuff because this at least was a Christian nation. But if you go to a Muslim country today, do you think that you will have the right to stand on a street corner and preach? For how long? You know, it's like someone once said, there are no closed countries in the world, only countries where it's hard to preach your second sermon. <laughs> That's Smyrna. It was a very dangerous and very deadly city. But in each of these places, the church becomes purified. Every place that there is suffering and persecution, the church becomes purified. The Bible ties things like this together. It ties suffering together with spiritual strength. James says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be complete and entire, lacking nothing. Tribulation worketh patience, and patience and endurance, and endurance hope. The New Testament is very clear that when we are dealing with the issue of suffering, we are dealing with God purifying his church and making it strong. That's what Smyrna is about. You know, don't consider it a strange thing, Peter tells us, when you fall into fiery trials, knowing that the trying of your faith works patience. God has promised it. First Peter is all about that. First Peter tells us that after we suffered a while, the God of grace, who's called us into eternal glory, will perfect us, confirm us, strengthen us. That's 1 Peter 5.10. As someone has once said, the purest Christian graces are those that are forged in the furnace of adversity. What we see at Smyrna is that power and purity comes to a church which successfully endures persecution. Smyrna has nothing bad said about it. It has a warning, you know, keep hanging in there. But it has nothing bad said about it, along with Philadelphia. It received no rebuke in the letter that Christ sent to it. Christian, uh, the scripture makes it clear that persecution and suffering is an essential part of the Christian life. 2 Timothy 3.12 all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Paul wrote that to young Timothy. Second Timothy is Paul's swan song. It's the last letter before he himself was martyred. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's interesting how Christ introduces himself here <clears throat> in this letter the first and the last, who is dead and is now alive. What is the worst thing the world can do to you? Is kill you. And so the way Jesus introduces himself to Smyrna, he was dead and is alive. In other words, folks at Smyrna, church in Collingswood, if they come in and kill you, it's not final. That's the worst thing. Jesus said, fear not him that can destroy the body, but can't do anything else. Fear him rather who can destroy both soul and body and cast you into hell. Only God can do that. So the guys have got it in reverse. The guys who are the bad guys, we would call the bad guys out there, think that they have the upper hand because they kill the body. God says, no. There's something scarier than that. 
Because you guys, the bad guys, you ones who are doing those things, someday not only are you going to get killed, but you're going to get thrown into hell too. And there you're going to burn and burn and burn and burn and burn and burn forever. Smyrna understood that. The first and the last. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. We saw that with Jesus in chapter 1, where the Lord Jesus Christ presents himself in the Son of Man vision to John. He is the first. He is the last. Everything else comes in between. He's the Alpha and Omega. That's the first and last letters of the alphabet. The Greek alphabet, that is. That means that everything that's written in the New Testament comes between that. He is the consummation of everything that is written in God's word. He's the beginning. He's the end. Nothing can be said outside of Jesus. That's how he introduces himself to Smyrna. He's the one who's the first and the last. The one who was dead, but is now alive. What an encouragement to a church that had seen some of their own members killed. What a church who was coming under the persecution of a city where the worship of the Roman emperor was the biggest cult in the city. In Ephesus, it was Diana. But at Smyrna, it was emperor worship. And Diocletian later required that everybody who did not offer an annual sacrifice to him would be put to death. And all the citizens were rounded up. They went house to house, they pulled them out, they brought them all down to the square, and one after another, they had to offer a sacrifice to the emperor. And if somebody was missing and wasn't there, and they had a town clerk who had the roles of where everybody was supposed to be, you know what, they went looking for them. And the Christians who didn't show up they sent out their secret service. They sent out their spies. They sent out their henchmen, their tough guys, to find the Christians and drag them down to the center of the city and make an illustration of what happens to people who refuse to worship the emperor. That was Smyrna. Now, you know, Smyrna was a beautiful place. It was considered the most beautiful city in the ancient world. It originally was probably founded about 3000 B.C., it was a place that was refounded once again and began to grow about 1000 BC. It was then fell into ruins and then it became rebuilt about 200 BC. And then it began to flourish almost like a resort. People love to go to Smyrna, beautiful place to go and see it. You know, how many of you would love to live in Hawaii? <laughs> I see a few hands there, yeah. If you had, did not have to pay taxes, and if you could have your very own villa up on the side of a, let's say, dormant volcano, one that you knew will not blow up for another hundred years, and you had somehow known this uh, in advance, and you could look out over all the lush Hawaiian landscape and see the beautiful sunsets, and suppose you had, I'm really making a picture, now don't get into this, but uh, one, of, one of those, um, Publishers clearing house things where they give you a thousand dollars a day, seven thousand dollars a week, you know. So you have all the money you need to do whatever you want, and you're young and still can have time to spend it. <laughs> think Smyrna. But then think if Hawaii were this way, where every year every person on the islands, and there's no way to get out of town. You know, no airplanes flying in and out on the day the sacrifices are being offered. You get rounded up and have to offer a pinch of salt to the emperor. Would you still want to live in Hawaii? I wouldn't. I'd rather live in a desert somewhere where there was no emperor worship. The church at Smyrna. Christ, the one who is dead and now lives. I am the resurrection and the life. Whosoever believeth in me shall never die. John chapter 11. 
the one who has conquered death. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 4. So when did the church at Smyrna, I mean, we know something about the history of Smyrna from secular writers, but when did the church at Smyrna get founded? We don't know for sure, but it may have been planted in Smyrna during Paul's Ephesian ministries, because it's not too far away. Paul may have planted the church. Maybe his converts planted that church. We don't know for sure. But we do know that it was a church that was going through persecution. And it's rather interesting that God in his sovereignty called it to give, get the name Smyrna. Smyrna comes from the root word which is translated myrrh. Tell me what were the gifts that the wise men brought? And myrrh. Gold speaks of the deity of Christ. Frankincense speak of his worship. Myrrh speaks of his death. He was given myrrh at his birth. We find him embalmed with the spices at his death. Smyrna, the place of myrrh, the place of death. And that, of course, is a beautiful picture of what was happening at the church in Smyrna. They were being crushed by persecution, and they gave off a very fragrant aroma concerning the faithfulness of God. Ephesus didn't have any love for Christ. Smyrna proved their love by suffering. If you were faced with suffering, would you prove your love? Or would you say, well, they can't really see what's in my heart, so I'll just mumble a few phrases uh, that are sort of ambiguous and we hope we can sneak out of this one. There have been a lot of so-called Christians throughout history that have done that. They come to the, the point of execution. They're told, we give you a choice. You can renounce Christ, and you can walk out of here a free man or a free woman. You can add a God, you know, just offer the pinch of salt to the emperor. You can do something that you said you would never do because you're a Christian. We'll let you go. But you see those five men over there with rifles? Mm hmm Do you understand that you're tied to a stake? Mm hmm Do you understand that if you don't deny Jesus, that they're going to raise their rifles, and every one of them will shoot you through the heart? Mm-hmm. Will you deny Christ? No, sir. Christ is my Savior and my Lord. Martin Luther had to face that choice at the Diet of Worms. Luther, here are your choices. Have you written these works? Yes. Do you hereby recant? He knew he was under the control of the Catholic Emperor. He argued, he said, well, but some of these, you know, deal with doctrine that's already accepted by the Catholic Church. That's not what we want to hear, Luther. Do you recant these writings? He said, if I did that, I'd be denying certain... No, Luther, do you recant? He replied, here I stand. I can do no other. God help me, I cannot and I will not recant. God spared his life and used him with power after that, but he had no guarantee that God would spare his life. Church history is full of men like that who would not recant their faith. Examine your soul. That's what Smyrna is talking about. Some of us are very skilled liars. 
Some of us are very good at equivocation. Some of us are bold-faced hypocrites. What would we do if we came to that test? Smyrna was a beautiful city, but it was a deadly city. I know your tribulations and your poverty, but you are rich. Did you know that true riches never pass away, even when you are dead poor? There's always a God who's there, and you know what he's promised? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, to give eternal heavenly rewards to those who trust him and walk by faith. You may never have two nickels to, uh, two pennies to rub together. But God promises, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Smyrna said it doesn't matter what they try to offer us, what they try to pay us, we're not like Balaam. We're not going to run after money and then compromise just so we can get a few bucks. Jesus knew how poor they were. He said, yeah, but he could have sent them money. You know, he could have sent them boat passage so they could get out of there. Uh, I mean, he could have sent them caravan passage so they could climb on a camel and get out of there. Do you know what? He didn't do it. Because there was something more important to the church. More important was purity. I don't know how to emphasize that too strongly. I look at this and I look at America. I look at what's going on with how initially, for example, President Trump was saying, uh, you know, uh, I really stand with the Second Amendment. And, uh, you know, then these school shootings take place suddenly begins to waffle on that. And he says, well, you know, maybe we ought to confiscate guns first and ask questions later. And you say, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. What was the Second Amendment all about? What's the due process all about? Did you know that there are two states where this already happened? Where the guy hasn't done anything wrong and they've come in and taken his guns away from him? Do you understand how this kind of thing can morph into the unacceptables of society like Christians and how it may be well we think they're a danger to society even if they don't have any guns Smyrna is around the corner because Satan hates the believers Philipsis is the word that's translated tribulation here. It means pressure. We're not talking about a stabbing kind of persecution or pains in the joints kind of thing. It's pressure. Have you ever felt pressure on your faith? And it's constant pressure. And the pressure begins to increase. Think of yourself lying on a bed and some pressure machine is on your chest. And at first you feel just a little bit, and then you feel a little bit more, and then you feel a little bit more and it's getting hard to breathe, and then you're feeling a little bit more and it's beginning to come on your abdomen and on your thighs and your legs and your arms, and it squeezes you, and it squeezes you, and it squeezes you, did you know the communists in Russia used that kind of thing on Bible translators? A number of years ago, Bob Jones University put out a film called The Printing. How many of you have seen that film? It's about Bible printing in Russia at the height of persecution of believers. Did anybody see that film? They catch the printer. One of the ways in which they torture him is they soak cloths in water and they wrap him tightly with these and then they put heat lamps on it so that the water evaporates and the cloth 
begins to shrink. And it's wrapped all around his body and all around his arms. And the pressure increases and increases and increases. Flips us. That's the word that's used here for tribulation. I know your tribulation. I know your poverty. You're under an intense squeeze. You have no money to solve the problem. You can't buy a passage out. You can't get food for your wife and kids. They'll give it to you if you'll just worship the emperor. A little pressure here, a little pressure there, a little pressure here, a little pressure there. How would you respond? What's your breaking point? That's what they were going through. Interesting here. The uh, <clears throat> religions in Smyrna were primarily emperor worship, but there were also other gods that were being worshipped at Smyrna. Zeus, Apollo, Aphrodite, Escepios, uh, Cybele. They, the Christians rejected the worship of all of these. They were the outsiders for everybody else in town. And it's interesting, they were clearly outsiders with Jews. It says, there were those who were of the synagogue of Satan who were blaspheming the Christians. Now the Christians experienced opposition from the Jews in many different places, but here the synagogue is called the synagogue of Satan. The devil had a very special hold on that particular synagogue. And they were claiming, well, we're really true Jews, and what you're offering is a pagan religion. This is not true Christianity. But Jesus says it's the synagogue of Satan. They were just as much followers of the devil as the pagan idol worshipers. And here it's the Lord Jesus Christ speaking, and he uses that very, very powerful term, blasphemy, which usually is used for you know, negative words against God, nasty words about God. But blasphemy... In scripture, blasphemy means to take on prerogatives that only belong to God and take them on for yourself. You're setting yourself up as God in the place of the true God. When you don't put God in first place and say the reason we're doing this is because of what the Word of God says, or you take the Word of God and use it as a bludgeon and you apply it in ways that it doesn't apply so that you can make yourself big and somebody else small. That's blasphemy. You're taking on prerogatives that belong only to God for yourself, and that is what blasphemy is. <clears throat> they, of course, uh, accuse the Christians of many different things. Uh, they accuse them of cannibalism, and this is something that happened through the Middle Ages, too. Um, they talked about the holy kiss being uh, uh, sexual immorality and so on, making many, many false accusations against the Christians. The hostility of Smyrna's Jewish population to the Christians wasn't new. We saw many times through the book of Acts the Jews were very much opposed to it. You find it about 20 times in the book of Acts where the Jews are in opposition to what is going on with the Christians. The persecution at Smyrna reached its peak half a century, 50 years after this letter was written when the Bishop Polycarp was killed. And um, you may not be aware of it, but the unbelieving Jews at Smyrna played a major role in the capture and death of Polycarp. Let me read you something from the encyclical epistle of the church at Smyrna concerning the martyrdom of the holy Polycarp. And here is the story of Polycarp's martyrdom in Smyrna. The whole multitude, marveling at the nobility of mind displayed by the devout and godly race of Christians, cried out, Away with the atheists, let Polycarp be sought out. But the most admirable Polycarp, when he first heard that he was sought for, was in no measure disturbed, but resolved to continue in the city. However, in deference to the wishes of many, he was persuaded to leave it, 
He departed, therefore, to a country house not far distant from the city. There he stayed with a few friends, engaged in nothing else night and day than praying for all men and for the churches throughout the world, according to his usual custom. And while he was praying, a vision presented itself to him three days before he was taken. And behold, a pillow under his head seemed to him on fire. Upon this, turning to those that were with him, he said to them prophetically, I must be burnt alive. And when those who sought for him were at hand, he departed to another dwelling, whither his pursuers immediately came after him. And when they found him not, they seized upon two youth that were there, one of whom, being subjected to torture, confessed. It was thus impossible that he should continue hid, since those that betrayed him were of his own household. The Irenarch then, whose office is the same as that of Clenonymus, by name Herod, hastened to bring him to the stadium. This all happened that he might fulfill his special lot, being made a partaker of Christ, and that they who betrayed him might undergo a punishment of Judas himself. His pursuers then, along with horsemen, and taking the youth with them, went forth at supper time of the day of preparation with their usual weapons as if going out against a robber. And being come about evening to the place where he was, they found him lying down in an upper room of a certain little house from which he might have escaped into another place, but he refused, saying, The will of God be done. So when he heard that they were come, he went down and spake with them. And as those that were present marveled his age and constancy, some of them said, Was so much effort made to capture such a venerable man? Immediately then, in that very hour, he ordered that something to eat and drink should be set before them, as much indeed as they cared for, while he besought them to allow him an hour to pray without disturbance. And on their giving him leave, he stood and prayed, being full of the grace of God, so that he could not cease for two full hours to the astonishment of them that heard him, insomuch that many began to repent that they had come forth against so godly and venerable an old man. Now as soon as he had ceased praying, having made mention of all that at any time came in contact with him, both small and great, illustrious and obscure, as well as the whole church throughout the world, the time of the departure having arrived, they set him upon an ass and conducted him into the city, the day being that of the great Sabbath. And the Aranarch Herod, accompanied by his father, Niketes, both riding in a chariot, met him, and taking him up into the chariot, they seated themselves beside him and endeavored to persuade him, saying, What harm is there in saying, Lord Caesar, and in sacrificing with the other ceremonies observed on such occasions, and so make sure of safety? But he at first gave them no answer. And when they continued to urge him, he said, I shall not do as you advise me. So they, having no hope of persuading him, began to speak bitter words unto him, and cast him with violence out of the chariot, insomuch that in getting down from the carriage, he dislocated his leg by the fall. But without being disturbed, and as if suffering nothing, he went eagerly forward with all haste, and was conducted to the stadium, where the tumult was so great that there was no possibility of being heard. Now as Polycarp was entering into the stadium, there came to him a voice from heaven saying, Be strong and show thyself a man, O Polycarp. No one saw who it was that spoke to him, but those of our brethren who were present heard the voice. And as he was brought forward, the tumult became great. When they heard Polycarp was taken, and when he came near, the proconsul asked him whether he was Polycarp. On his confessing that he was, the proconsul sought to persuade him to deny Christ, saying, Have respect to thy old age and other similar things, according to their custom, such as, swear by the fortune of Caesar, repent and say away with the atheists. The Christians were called atheists at this time because they didn't believe in all these gods. But Polycarp, gazing with stern countenance on all the multitude of the wicked heathen, then in the stadium, and waving his hand toward them, while with groans he looked up to heaven, said, away with the atheists. Then the proconsul urging him and said, swear and I will set thee at liberty, reproach Christ. Polycarp declared, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never did me any injury. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? And when the proconsul yet again pressed him and said, Swear by the fortune of Caesar, he answered, Since thou art vainly urgent that, as thou sayest, I should swear by the fortune of Caesar, and pretendest not to know who and what I am, hear what the doctrines of Christianity are. Appoint me a day, and thou shalt hear. The proconsul replied, Persuade the people. But Polycarp said, To thee I have thought it right to offer an account of my faith. For we are taught to give all due honor, which entails no injury upon ourselves, to the powers and authority which are ordained of God. 
But as for these, I do not deem them worthy of receiving the account from me. The proconsul then said to him, I have wild beasts at hand. To these will I cast thee, except thou repent. But he answered, Call them then. For we are not accustomed to repent of what is good in order to adopt that which is evil. And it is well for me to be charged from what is evil to what is righteous. But again the proconsul said to him, I will cause thee to be consumed by fire, seeing thou despisest the wild beasts, if thou wilt not repent. But Polycarp said, Thou threatenest me with fire, which burneth for an hour, and after a little is extinguished. But art thou ignorant of the fire of the coming judgment, and of eternal punishment, reserved for the ungodly? But why tarriest thou? Bring forth what thou wilt. While he spoke these things and many other things like it, he was filled with confidence and joy, and his countenance was full of grace, so that not merely did it fall as if troubled by the things said to him, but on the contrary, the proconsul was astonished and sent his herald to proclaim in the midst of the stadium, Polycarp has confessed that he is a Christian. This proclamation having been made by the herald, the whole multitude, both of the heathen and the Jews who dwelt at Smyrna, cried out with uncontrollable fury and in a loud voice, this is the teacher of Asia, the father of the Christians and the overthrower of our gods. He who has been teaching many not to sacrifice or to worship the gods. Speaking thus, they cried out and brought Philip, the Asiarch, to let loose a lion upon Polycarp. The Poly but Philip answered that it was not lawful for him to do so, seeing the shows of wild beasts were already finished. Then it seemed good to them to cry out with one consent that Polycarp should be burnt alive. For thus it behooved the vision which was revealed to him in regard to his pillow to be fulfilled. When seeing it on fire as he was praying, he turned about and said, prophetically to the faithful that were with him, I must be burnt alive. This then was carried into effect with greater speed than it was spoken. The multitudes immediately gathered together wood and faggots out of the shops and baths, Jews especially according to custom, eagerly assisting them in it. And when the funeral pyre was ready, Polycarp laying aside all his garments and loosing his girdle, sought also to take off his sandals, a thing he was not accustomed to do, inasmuch as every one of the faithful was always eager who should first touch his skin. For on account of his holy life, he was, even before his martyrdom, adorned with every kind of good. Immediately then, they surrounded him with those substances which had been prepared for the funeral pyre. When they were about to also to fix him with nails, he said, Leave me as I am, for he, he that giveth me strength to endure the fire will also enable me, without your securing me by nails, to remain without moving in the pile. They did not nail him then, but simply bound him. And he, placing his hands behind him and being bound like a distinguished ram, taken out of the great flock for sacrifice, and prepared to be an acceptable burnt offering unto God, looked up into heaven and said, O Lord God Almighty, the Father of thy beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, by whom we have received the knowledge of thee, the God of angels and powers, and of every creature, and of the whole race of the righteous who live before thee, I give thee thanks that thou hast counted me worthy of this day and this hour, that I should have a part in the number of thy martyrs in the cup of thy Christ to the resurrection of eternal life, both of soul and body, through the incorruption imparted by the Holy Ghost, among whom may I be accepted this day before thee, as a fat and acceptable sacrifice, according as thou, the ever truthful God, hath foreordained, hast revealed before and unto me, and thou hast fulfilled. Therefore also I praise thee for all things, I bless thee, I glorify thee along with the everlasting and heavenly Jesus Christ, thy beloved Son, with whom to thee and the Holy Ghost be glory both now and to all coming ages. Amen. When he had pronounced the Amen and so finished his prayer, those who were appointed for the purpose kindled the fire. And as the flame blazed forth in great fury, to whom it was given to witness it, beheld a great miracle and have been preserved that we might report it to others. What took place then for the fire shaping itself into a form of an ark, like the sail of a ship when filled with the wind, encompassed as by a circle the body of the martyr and appeared within not like flesh which is burnt, but as bread that is baked, or as gold and silver glowing in a furnace. 
Moreover, we perceive such a sweet odor coming from the pile as if frankincense or some other precious spices have been smoking there. At length, when those wicked men perceived that his body could not be consumed by the fire, they commanded an executioner to go near and pierce him through with a dagger. And in so doing this, there came forth a dove and a great quantity of blood. So the fire was extinguished, and all the people wondered that there should be such a difference between unbelievers and the elect, of whom this most admirable Polycarp was one, having in our own time such an apostolic and prophetic teacher and bishop of the church, which is in Smyrna, for every word that went out of his mouth either has been or yet shall be accomplished. Obviously, there are things that have been added to it, but it gives us the death of the leader of the church at Smyrna 50 years after Christ gave his letter to the church at Smyrna. What did he say in verse 10? Do not fear what you're about to suffer. pick it up there next week, the Lord willing. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word, for its power, for the testimony of those who've gone before us, those who were faithful unto death. And Jesus said, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. What do we want? Do we want this temporal life? Or do we want the crown of life? If it comes to that, Father, make us those who are faithful unto death. Like Smyrna, the church that was purified by suffering. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Our closing hymn tonight is how firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord. Number 408. And think about verse 3. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace, all sufficient, shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, thy only design, thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. 408. Let's stand.